you know, I spoke with people who, um, like a lot of researchers who've spent their entire careers working on reducing our exposure to cancer causing chemicals in various parts of our everyday lives. And over and over again, what I, what I heard from them when I said, you know, so what do you do in your own life to try to avoid contact with these chemicals, they said, um, you know, I, I pick a couple of things. I do this or that. I try to buy organic groceries for my kids. I avoid uh, personal care products that contain these this list of ingredients. But really, these chemicals are so ubiquitous that we can't shop our way out of this problem. Have you ever wondered why the vast majority of cancer research focuses on treatment as opposed to prevention? If so, you are not alone. This is true despite the fact that two-thirds of all cancer cases are linked to preventable environmental causes. That's just one of the many findings in my guest Christina Marusic's new book titled A New War on Cancer, The Unlikely Heroes Revolutionizing Prevention. Christina is an award-winning journalist at Environmental Health Sciences, and she covers environmental health and justice at ehn.org and dailyclimate.org. So you might want to check those out. But she's also been published by CNN, Slate, Vice, Women's Health, Washington Post, Bustle, and many other publications. This book not only illuminate, illuminates an array of specific harmful environmental exposures, it goes further to highlight the work of individuals who are working to reverse these very harmful effects while calling on all of us, each of us and all of us, to advocate for tougher laws to protect our health. Now, if you are enjoying this podcast, maybe learning something from it, if you wouldn't mind, please take a moment now to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to it or watching it on. And now please just sit back and enjoy this conversation with Christina Marusic. Hello, Christina Marusic. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Deborah. It's great to be here. It's it's really great to have you here. And uh, I'm excited to jump right in because uh, you've written this book, which I think is very important. I want people to know about it. I want them to read it and I want them to know why they should read it. So, um, I'm, I'm excited to talk about this book. And, uh, I think before we even talk about your background, I'm just gonna, let's see if I can show this book, hopefully. Yep. A new war on cancer, the unlikely heroes revolutionizing prevention. Um, and the key here is prevention, which is what really is I think your your goal is not to scare people, not to say there's, you know, we're all exposed to cancer all the time, but how do we how do we prevent what's become a pretty serious epidemic? So, um, mm -hmm. let's just let me back up a little bit and just talk about your background. Um, you're an environmental investigative reporter, which is a very important job these days. Probably one of the most important ones. Get some truth out there amidst all the noise. Um, you're a reporter at EHN, which is Environmental Health News. I hadn't heard of that. I'm excited to start following. And also dailyclimate.org. So that's your that's your day job. But then you've also written a lot, right? For You've written um, bylines and articles for CNN, Slate, uh, What a Wash Post, The Advocate, Bustle, which is my new discovery. So, so you've got your, uh, you have your, your creds in order. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, so so now are you full time as a reporter or? Yeah, so that... most of those other um, bylines you mentioned were from uh, when I was a freelance journalist I see. Um, before I started working for Environmental Health News. And I should mention that our parent organization is called Environmental Health Sciences. Oh. And um, that is an organization that was founded by a scientist. Um, his name is Pete Myers, and he wrote a really important early book about endocrine disrupting chemicals. Oh. So um, it's 
it's very much also part of my background, part of my day job um, to be, you know, focused on the science around these things. And um, he founded Environmental Health News to help translate science into, you know, stories and language that everyday folks, non-scientists could understand more easily to help kind of drive good science into public discussion and legislation related to harmful yes, chemicals. So, that so is, the book very yeah, much came out of my reporting. Yeah. And there's so much fluff in stories oftentimes. So what you're, you're kind of telling us, this is science-based, this is not just what you're gathering from other sources, but you're actually working with scientists. You know, this, this, um, this is a point that I think we don't often really get just in the general world and just, you know, the, those of us who aren't technically in journalism or science is, and the same with uh, climate is that the scientists have been screaming for years about all these things, but they need that to be translated to people who can t put it in story format. And honestly, that so that people can relate to it and, you know, be one with it rather than be intimidated by it. Um, it's it's good for the scientists too, right? They get to get their word out and, and do yeah, their, I, focus on their work, you know, their science. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I, I really kind of think of my job as being a translator. Like mm -hmm. I read these sort of complex scientific studies and I ask every question I can think of to the authors mm -hmm. and I I try to, you know, explain what they've done in the simplest possible terms, um, because yeah. it can be really hard. It can be really hard to, um, you know, read these kinds of studies and figure out what's going on if you don't have a science yeah. background. Or the time or even know where to start. You just don't. That's right. Um, yeah. But what I, what I could say from the book right off the, uh, at the beginning is that it's very readable and that it's, you based it on human beings. <laughs> you know, you, you, you talk about six, is it six, I think different, uh, individuals in the book, rather than talking about the scary thing or that scary thing, you're talking about humans and what they've gone through in their life story. And that made it almost more novelish almost than just a, it's certainly not scientific, even though you have the science in there. So um, it, it was a great marriage between storytelling and facts. So congratulations on that. And it's your first book. So that that's remarkable. Yeah. Thank well, you so much. It is my first book. And I'm, I'm really glad to hear you say that, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to have the book be focused on these very human stories that you mentioned mm -hmm. is that um, it's a lot easier to advocate for um, cancer treatments than it is for prevention. Mm -hmm. And treatments are really important. Of course, I would never say we should stop doing that or we should do less right. of that. But um, right now, only seven to nine percent of global funds for cancer go toward prevention, uh -huh. and all the rest go toward um, better treatments. And it's also easier to get people on board for, um, you know, like a race for the cure kind of thing than it is for prevention. And one of the mm -hmm. reasons is. It, you can put a picture of a little girl who's battling cancer on the t-shirt and on the Facebook page. And of course yeah. we all empathize with that so much and we want to do what we can to help out. Yeah. But when it comes to prevention, you know, it's the nature of prevention that we don't get to know whose life we saved or which child we prevented from getting a childhood cancer diagnosis. That's interesting. And, um, we often tend, you know, when we talk about prevention, it often gets, talked about in terms of like long-term cancer rates and a lot of data and statistics. And that's important, but it's a lot harder to connect with emotionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to ground this book in human stories, um, yeah. you know, and try to make it clear that uh, cancer prevention is also about humans and protecting humans. And, 100%. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's not as obvious as it, as one might think. So I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, what, what do you think it was? Was it just your research? Did you have some personal connection to this? I mean, most of us have lost someone to cancer or had it ourselves. Um, what, what took you from writing articles to saying this is important enough that I want to make, takes a while to write a book, done it a few times. <laughs> it's a big endeavor. Yeah, so yeah, it is. It is. My uh, younger sister, Abby, was diagnosed with thyroid cancer when she was 25 years old. Yeah. And 
thyroid cancer tends to run in families, but no one else in our family has ever had it. Mm -hmm. So we were really left wondering whether um, she might've been exposed to something or mm -hmm. my mom might've been exposed to something while she was right. pregnant with my sister that could have mm -hmm. contributed to her cancer. And when we tried to look into that question and we tried asking her doctors, we really just couldn't get a very satisfactory answer. It was tough to find information about it. And um, my sister is doing great. This was 10 years ago and she's um, had her thyroid removed and went through treatment and has been in remission mm. for a decade. Um, and I, and, you know, so I'm incredibly grateful that those yeah. treatments existed for her. Um, but, but my sister and anyone else who has survived cancer would certainly say that they would have rather had prevention than treatment, right? Cancer treatment right. is really difficult. It can have um, side effects that last for your whole life. I know sure. she gets anxiety every time she still has to go in for a follow-up scan. And yeah, um, you're always wondering. Right. And so, you know, then I started my career as an investigative reporter mm -hmm. and uh, my sister and I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which has a lot of problems with industrial air pollution. Right. Um, you know, people think of that in Pittsburgh's history, but we still very much have ongoing problems with that here. And hmm. um, so as an investigative reporter, I did, I wrote a five part series a couple of years ago um, on the high rates of certain types of cancers that we see in this region, including thyroid cancer. And um the role that our air pollution might be playing in those mm -hmm. high, higher than average cancer rates. Mm -hmm. And the series won a couple of awards and I got a really lovely note from a publisher saying, congratulations on your awards. Would you have any interest in turning this into a book with a national focus? And yeah. four very long years later, <laughs> this is that book. That's lovely to have an invitation to write a book, though, because you you know you know the end result is going to result in something tangible rather than go shopping for for a publisher. Right. So that it does, certainly uh, helps with the process. It, yeah, yeah, it certainly does. But also, I think they saw your writing was was so solid and so engaging. So I think you know, in addition to the, in in addition to the importance, because I don't feel like there is a, of having it out there on the market that people who you know we don't have much access to other books. Like you would think that the the shelves would be filled with books like this. Uh, they are not. So it's, it's, it's an important uh, introduction for a lot of people. I think one of the points that I really also appreciated that you focused on is that um, we tend to think like I do, I try not, I don't eat meat. I think I saw that you're vegetarian. You know, there's a lot of things that we each do to try to take personal responsibility. You know, I, I'm not going to eat this. I'm not going to smoke. Um, I'm not going to try to live in an area if you have the financial choice about it, where it's, it's deeply, there's air pollution, water pollution, et cetera, um, which kind of touches on who has to live there. And we'll talk about that later. Um, it's not always a choice, obviously. So, but all those things aren't enough. And that's really, I think your point in the book, right? That we need to have policy changes. We can't just, we don't even know. And, and honestly, I'm going to stop talking really right now, but I will say, since I read your book, I'm a little paranoid. I start looking at almost everything I pick up and I always, I thought I was pretty aware already, but canned beans, you know, I live, I ate a lot of beans and things like that, that I hadn't kept up with. So uh, having someone else, having policy change, as opposed to us having to carry the whole burden to know what to avoid, I think is the biggest, maybe takeaway from the book. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I spoke with people who, um, like a lot of researchers who spent their entire careers working on reducing our exposure to cancer causing chemicals in various parts of our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. And over and over again, what I, what I heard from them when I said, you know, so what do you do in your own life to try to avoid contact with these chemicals. Yeah. They said, um, you know, I, I pick a couple of things. I do this or that. I try to yeah. buy organic groceries for my kids. I avoid uh, personal care products that contain these this list of ingredients. Yeah. But really, these chemicals are so ubiquitous that 
we can't shop our way out of this problem. Mm -hmm. And this is coming from people, you know, who like have PhDs in organic chemistry. And they're saying, even if you spend all day, every day thinking about and working on this issue, there's no amount of kind of personal vigilance that can totally protect you from these exposures. They're just impossible to completely avoid. And so we need uh, better protections. We need regulations that will protect us all from these chemicals. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think we do tend to think of, you know, oftentimes when we talk about like harmful chemicals in personal care products, for example, Mm -hmm. we tend to say it's not fair for low income people who can't afford to buy the more expensive products that have fewer toxic chemicals in them. But really, um, you know, That's true. Regardless of how much money you have or how much information you have or how much time you have to Mm -hmm. meticulously read labels, Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just not possible to totally avoid these on your own. And so we're really kind of all in this together. Right. We need better protections. Um, It's kind of we're all safe or none of us are safe when it comes to these chemicals. Yeah, that's a hugely important point. and and so many of the things you say, I can apply them to other things like the environment. You know, if you said, well, I I can protect myself from the, the worst kinds of uh, environmental degradation because I can live in a area that's completely protected because I have the means to do that. But, you know, we all need water. We all need air. We all need. And, and you're right. The whole idea that we're going to parse ourselves by uh, how much money we have, as opposed to knowing that we're all in it together is is uh it's not healthy to think that way so um all right well you know we are going to talk about maybe uh, five or more steps that we people can take to protect themselves but before we go there let's talk about what some of these issues are and um i don't know i uh one of the maybe if you wouldn't mind starting with something like uh pfas which uh is a sounds like a cute little nickname for something very very not cute um you said 45 or or other what they're called forever chemicals. And I'll have you talk about that. Like 45% of our water has these forever chemicals in it. So maybe, and I, can you filter those out or is that something you can just talk a little bit more about where all we get the, those forever chemicals in our lives without knowing. Yeah. Um, so PFAS, he said it's like a cute little name. Yeah. It's an uh, acronym that's short for a very not cute name. It's per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. So you can see why people use that yeah. acronym instead. Um, and that's a class of more than 15,000 chemicals that all have similar chemical properties. You mentioned that they're called forever chemicals. The reason for that is that they never break down. And that means they can build up and accumulate in the environment and in Mm -hmm. human bodies and in animal bodies. Um, They're linked to all kinds of health effects, including increased cancer risk. And Mm -hmm. um, they're used to make products non-stick or waterproof or um, Mm stain-free, things like Scotchgard that you would like spray on a couch to prevent stains. That's made of PFAS chemicals. Um, Teflon and non-stick pans are coated with these chemicals. Mm -hmm. Um, And almost any a lot of our clothing that's uh, labeled as waterproof or stain proof contain these chemicals. So okay. um, these chemicals are, are really widespread and um, scientists have known about the problems they can cause for many decades. Um, but unfortunately we're kind of just starting to see increased public awareness about this. Um, a couple of years ago, a movie came out called Dark Waters mm-hmm. with Mark Ruffalo. Mm-hmm. That movie is about these chemicals. Mm-hmm. And um, a recent study found that 45% of American tap water contains PFAS chemicals. Um, the EPA has proposed some limits on some of the most common PFAS chemicals in drinking water. And those are expected to uh, go into effect and become law, I think by the end of 2023. And that will require water authorities to test for them, which right now they're not required to test for them. And if they find them, it'll require them to um, filter them out. But again, they'll only be testing for and filtering a handful of 
this class of chemicals that has more than 15,000 chemicals in it. You can um, filter them out at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a nonprofit, the Environmental Working Group, that uh, just did a big study on which filters work best for PFAS. Um, and I know I have it here. The filters they found that removed all PFAS were uh, zero water filter and hmm. something called clearly filtered. Those were the um, hmm. pitcher filters they found. And then they found a travel, a travel filter system called Berkey, B-E-R-K-E-Y. And all of those blocked 100% of the PFAS. Huh. That they that's interesting. For. Okay, that's good to know. What about things like reverse osmosis? Do they only take out a portion of the PFAS, or are you familiar with that? Uh, I believe I think reverse osmosis also removes them. Um, yeah. That's more expensive uh, right. than like a pitcher filter for for right. most works, especially to right. do like a whole house filter. Um, right. But I think reverse osmosis is also effective at mm -hmm. removing these. And unfortunately, um, PFAS have also been found in some bottled water. Um, there was a study by researchers at Johns Hopkins a couple of years ago that found PFAS in 39 out of about a hundred bottles they tested and they found that uh, bottled water labeled purified was less likely to contain PFAS than bottled water labeled spring water. But again, this is why back to the individual, right, we need regulations this for this because this is not right. fair to ask yeah. individual consumers to know all of this and figure this all out just right. to have safe drinking water. Yeah. Um, and, and, but it's in so many other places, right? Like uh, I had a, I had an amazing uh, guest on a few months ago uh, who is 12 years old. Her name is Madhvi Shukatur. And she, she's she been working against PFAS, uh, sorry, PFAS since she was uh, like six, something crazy like that, but was able to get them out of her entire school, uh, not district, which has thousands and thousands of kids in it and has also worked with the government, the local and state government to get it out of other, um, it was, mostly it was styrofoam, which she was trying to get because styrofoam mm -hmm. is also a, a large, um, transmitter. I don't know what the word might be for P PFAS. So it's everywhere, right? It's in almost all of our takeout foods and papers and things that you just don't expect. So, um, but people can make a difference on that individual level, like this young girl, it's, and it's not, yes, she has parental help, but it's actually her. And sometimes you look at that and you think, oh my God, really? She's 12 years old now. She's working even at the UN, she's working with them too. So we can Incredible. all make a significant difference, if, but, but she studied it and she knew about it. The rest of us don't necessarily know about it. And I guess it's a little bit our job, just like in the environment, it's, a little bit of all our jobs to also take take some control over you know when we vote what how we educate ourselves what we read about just to be aware so um yeah yeah i think i tried you know the book has a lot of information about where these chemicals are and mm -hmm. why they're a problem mm -hmm. um and and some tips on how we can avoid them in our own lives. Um, and then really says, you know, and take some of that energy to call your legislator and, right. uh, let them know this issue is important to you and figure out ways to push for systemic change instead of, uh, you know, becoming totally obsessed and worried about, right. uh, your individual exposures. Right. However, the less we bring things into our house that we're not familiar with, like take out food. It, it sounds crazy, but it does make a difference to kind of stay aware. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you, um, yeah, just to explain that a little bit, um, I wrote in the book about a study that found that, um, most takeout containers and wrappers are coated with these chemicals to stop grease from seeping through. So right. that little piece of paper that's underneath of every pizza you have ever gotten, that's coated in yeah. PFAS. Yeah. You would um, never, even the kind of, know that. I know. Like, even the think of it. Right. Even the, when you so. get like baked goods from a bakery, if they come wrapped in a little piece of paper, that's often hmm. coated in PFAS. And then research indicates that we are getting some of these 
in our bodies as a result of eating food that touches mm -hmm. these chemicals. And a couple of big restaurant chains and retailers and grocery stores have pledged to phase these chemicals out. Um, but again, <laughs> are you going to change like which restaurant you eat at based on whether or not they're going to have PFAS in their food wrappers by 2025? Or would we rather just say, you know, other parts of the world, other countries have banned PFAS in all food packaging. So I think it's yeah. also important to note that the United States is behind um, a lot mm -hmm. of other places when it comes to regulating these chemicals. Yeah. Yeah. It's always surprising to learn that, but um, it's the case in, a lot of situations that, well, we have money talking here a lot more than we do in other parts of the world. I mean, we have mm -hmm. a lot more corporate um, and even lobbyists in our in our world, in our country, I should say, that they're not always thinking of our health. In fact, they often are only thinking of, of uh, not everyone, but certainly I, I would say a majority are much more focused on the the financial aspects of the profits rather than the health of the, of the population. That's um, true. Can you talk about uh, BPAs a little bit? Um, just that, that seems to be a huge thing that I think we sh might be able to think about in our own, mm -hmm. at least for, cause some people aren't going to say, well, yes, they want to, you know, things will be phased, phased out and we need systemic change. But if today I could stop bringing styrofoam into my house and maybe can't, you know, and I think BPAs yeah. kind of fall into that um, category. Yeah, BPA is is also important to talk about because there's a cautionary tale there about um, regrettable replacements. Hmm. So sometimes you'll notice when you're buying plastic stuff, especially if it's for babies, like a plastic bottle um, or Gosh. food containers, it'll say BPA free. But 90% of the time, um, they have replaced the BPA in that product with another chemical that has very similar chemical properties and is equally harmful. And so the BPA free label became more of a marketing tool than a meaningful way for consumers yeah. to avoid this kind of exposure, unfortunately. So I think um, you mentioned cans. Can linings are treated with BPAs. If mm. you can switch your your bean consumption to, I eat a lot of beans too as a vegetarian, and um, I'll use a can of beans in a pinch, but I started like uh, cooking, you know, keeping dry right. beans around and cooking a big batch and then like putting bags in the freezer mm -hmm. to avoid cans. And again, that's yeah. like a lot of lift. So if I haven't done that and I need a can of beans, I'm not going to worry about it too much, but it's right. one way to kind of over time, just reduce the amount of, um, stuff that you're exposed to. And, um, there are some companies, like I know that, um, there are companies that are working on green chemistry solutions and developing can linings that don't contain any of these uh, yeah. BPA or similar chemicals. Yeah. Um, Valspar, I know, was trying to replace its can linings with a, a less toxic option. And once that becomes, um, you know, if it's clear that consumers want that, that'll become more the norm in the market. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think one of the the simplest things we can do to reduce our exposure to these harmful chemicals is not heating plastic. Mm -hmm. um, even when things say they're microwave safe, or if you're going to, you know, if you're boiling water for like instant foods, um, don't don't eat food that has come into contact with heated plastic when you can help it. Um, and I yeah. think that's especially true for, for babies and kids. If you can avoid heating, microwaving their food in plastic containers. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely um, a kind of simple way to avoid some of these exposures. And again, I don't want to, you know, don't want to cause alarm. Um, these are, these are generally small exposures, but science yeah, increasingly suggests that they, they add up. That's right. Yeah, so anything yeah. you can do especially to kind of body, you know, you right. Gotta, especially in a little body. Yeah. Right. That's right. So anything you can do, um, to just kind of decrease these exposures over time, um, especially something simple, like, not putting plastic in the microwave, um, you know, generally worth doing, especially so if it's easy. So let me ask more about that then, especially baby bottles, because that seems like a um, low hanging fruit, you know, should, should you replace it with glass bottles? Is that the best option? And then you think about those nipples are made from, you know, rubber, rubber, I guess, and plastic. I don't know. It's been a while since I've actually used one. <laughs> fed my yeah, children. Yeah, my... 
My sister has two. My sister who had thyroid cancer has two yeah. little kids, my niece and nephew. Mm. And um, I strongly suggested that she use glass baby bottles. She was mm-hmm. able to find some, especially for for heating sure. them. Um, you know, of course, like if they were out of the house, like it, it's never, it doesn't have to be perfect, I think is right. what I emphasize to her. Like it doesn't have to be this all or nothing thing, yes. but if you can use less plastic, then yeah. that's a win. So she switched to, you know, for their like dinner plates and bowls, she got them these um, like metal mm. or ceramic sets, mostly metal since they're getting thrown around, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, silicone um, pacifiers and baby bottle nipples are available. Like food grade silicone is definitely safer than plastic. Okay. Um, so she, she has really tried to kind of switch to, um, silicone and glass and metal options for her little ones where they're yeah. available. And when, when you mentioned, uh, the beans before and, and the cans, uh, like cooking your own beans and freezing them, uh, does that, does it, <laughs> So I'm thinking about all these things that I'm going through since I've read your book. So I have these like heavy plastic containers that I use to freeze things with, you know, I try to avoid plastic as much as I can. And then I just like, wait a minute, this is I'm, now I'm cooking these beans and then I'm putting them in plastic. Is that, is that the same problem if you put it in the freezer? I mean, can you actually avoid it mm-hmm. if you, or should you just put glass in the freezer as well? What do you think? You can put glass in the freezer. I would say if you're not, um, I, I don't think freezing plastic um, causes those chemicals to leach into food in the same way that heating does. Mm -hmm. So it's probably a little safer for freezing. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually, you know, if you're putting the hot beans, if putting hot beans into plastic, the heat is important. Right, right. The heat is important. Um, I often like dry them on a like baking sheet um, mm-hmm. and freeze them that way so they don't clump together. And then I just throw them in like a Ziploc bag and keep them oh, in Ziploc bags in the okay. freezer. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And of okay. course all of this is like more work and not totally accessible than just like opening a can of beans. And right. so it, it's like a, you know, if I've had the time and I have them in the freezer, great. And if not, yeah. I'll use a can and I'm not too worried about it. No. All right. So much to think about. Um, <laughs> Do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about? I never pronounce this correctly. The the, the main ingredient in Roundup, glyphosate. glyphosate. Yeah, yeah. Where are we with that? And can you talk about that a little bit? Because that seems that has been in the news. I think it's something that people. Um, I know we're kind of going back to the forever chemicals. Mm-hmm. We kind of uh, jumped over that with the BPAs, but I just didn't want to forget it because uh, I've just been surprised at how speaking of ubiquitous, how ubiquitous that still is. I think they're phasing. Uh, so Bayer bought Monsanto, which is, it was questionable who produced the the Roundup and glyphosate. Um, and then there's been so many lawsuits. I mean, mm-hmm. thousands of lawsuits about the chemicals, especially in certain types of, of cancer. Um, I think non, non Hodgkin's lymphoma is one of the, the big ones that have been uh, attributed to the use of Roundup. Uh, is that something that you studied much or that you're very aware of? Because I think 2023, they're phasing it out slowly, right? very slowly, but it's not yeah, illegal so, to use it anymore. Yeah. Right. Glyphosate um, is one of a lot of many pesticides that are banned in other parts of the world because of their potential to harm human health that mm. are still widely used in the United States. And yeah. you're right um, that that Bayer Monsanto is um, in the process of of phasing out glyphosate because of these class action lawsuits. But a voluntary phase out is not the same as a ban, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It means they might still show up in certain products and not others. Mm -hmm. You know, I still see my neighbors out spraying their weeds with Roundup in their yard when they have little kids and dogs playing out there, um, despite these many class action lawsuits finding that it caused cancer in people. Um, and, and it's, it's all kind of, um, points to bigger problems with our, um, pesticide regulations in the United States. So one of the advocates I spoke to for the book is, um, 
the director of the Children's Environmental Health Network and the health risks of pesticide exposure among children um, are more severe than they are for adults. That's true for a lot of these exposures. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that they have smaller bodies, but um, kids you know, they're also still developing these complex bodily oh, systems. And so yeah. there's a lot more that can get disrupted in ways that mm -hmm. can lead to cancer. Um, sometimes much later in life, you know, that scientists are finding that exposures that happen when we're babies and kids can impact our cancer risk in adulthood. And even that our great grandmother's exposure Exposures really? to carcinogens can impact our cancer risk, either um, for childhood goodness. cancer or in our adulthood. Right. So um, this person I spoke to who's head of the Children's Environmental Health Network, a lot of their advocacy work centers around pesticides and getting better pesticide regulations in the United States. Um, I... I wrote some about this in the book that there are dozens of pesticides that are banned in other parts of the world because the science is very clear that they can cause health harms and that mm -hmm. there is residue on the food that gets treated with them, that gets ingested by people um, that are just not regulated in the United States. And the main reason for that is the chemical lobby, as you mentioned. Um, the chemical lobby in the United States is mm. um, really well-funded and really powerful. And so yeah. another, another way we can help address this at the systematic level is, um, you know, pushing for uh, more transparency in government, restricting campaign contributions from corporate donors, and restricting the power of lobbyists in the federal government. And then mm -hmm. there's also a lot um, that can be done at the state level um, when it comes yes. to these things. And, yes. and I think that's worth mentioning because sometimes, you know, federal changing federal legislation can feel like such a daunting task. It takes a long time. It's really yes. um, complicated. We have less access to those lawmakers. But I think it's important to mention that um, uh, states are really kind of stepping up when it comes to chemical regulations yes. right now in the absence of meaningful federal regulations. Mm -hmm. And that often ends up protecting people in um, in all the all 50 states. So for example, Washington state just recently passed a really landmark piece of legislation banning a bunch of toxic and cancer causing chemicals mm -hmm. in consumer products and electronics. And okay. once that goes into effect, it's really would be complicated for manufacturers to make like one set of lipstick that they sell to residents in Washington oh. state that don't oh. have these chemicals and then a different version for people in yeah. every other state. It'd be too much of a headache in terms of shipping and distribution right. and labeling. So they just end up switching the formula and it ends up protecting all of that us. That is just such a huge point that I honestly, if you wrote that in the book, I'm sorry, I missed it because uh, that's, that's so significant. I, kn I know that, it's easier to get, even in cities, you might even think of it that way. Cause I, I live in Denver and I know that through, you know, they banned the, uh, a lot of plastic wear and not necessarily for some of this is environmental, some of it's health, but you know, just to automatically put plastic, uh, utensils in every takeout order, most people aren't even using mm -hmm. them, things like that right. or straws. There was a lot around straws, you know, sometimes you go hyper-focused on a certain item, but it gets people thinking. And then when you've got a city that can certainly the same thing can kind of feed up into the state and then the state can feed up into the, the national. So it, I think that just gives us another reason to, you know, that voting is so important, even in your mm -hmm. city council, just in your very small local election, our politics yeah. is local. So it, it makes, cause the, otherwise we feel so helpless. It's like, I can't fight mm -hmm. Monsanto. I can't right. fight the lobbyists in Washington. Um, but it's much, there's lobbyists at the state levels too, obviously, but not all lobbyists are bad, but um, certainly in this case, that, that, that that point is is so significant that they don't want to have a special special item for every single state. So that that's really I appreciate you mentioning that. That's also why um, uh, I did write about this in the book. That's also why people who don't live in California have probably seen those Prop sixty five yeah. warnings that say yeah. this product contains chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer or yeah. uh, reproductive harm, um, and 
that the reason you see those when you don't live in California is that California passed a law saying harmful chemicals in consumer products have to be labeled to warn consumers. And they don't, they're not going to put a sticker only on the stuff yeah. getting sold to people in California, right? So then right. everyone gets that label. That's another really clear example of um, California's stricter chemical regulations kind of benefiting the rest of us too. That that's good to know. I um I think I I hear people complain about it too. Is oh California, they're such a pain in the because you know that oh I can't use or you can't buy a certain product. I've had that happen. I haven't been able to buy something or or else at least be a warning online that this product was made in California and there the, this phrase you just said, which I can't reiterate that quickly, but it contains products that have been known to cause cancer, basically. And mm -hmm. oh you know I I hear this quite often. Like they're just a pain. They, they have a problem with everything in California. Well, maybe, <laughs> or maybe they're protecting the rest of us. So um, you can make a big difference locally, I think is what we're coming back to. Yeah. Um, could you, Christina, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, there's so many things that you cover in the book, but one of the things I, I'd really like to have you touch on is the disproportionality of how these uh, a lot of whether it's water pollution, air pollution, things in our food affect people of color more than than white people, for example. Yeah, so I think um, let me actually find. So research has found that uh, Black Americans are exposed to higher levels of air pollution, and specifically cancer causing substances and air pollution than their white mm -hmm. counterparts, regardless of socioeconomic status. And also That's um, interesting, that point. across right across state boundaries and whether they're in urban or rural settings. So yeah. I think that's really surprising to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. We tend to think of um, uh, environmental justice communities as being um, communities of color that are low income. But actually, um, research has really cl clearly shown that socio socioeconomic status matters less than race when it comes to um, these it's exposures really and air pollution. And the reason for that is uh, systemic racism and our history of redlining and Jim Crow laws. So okay. Um, those laws pushed uh, Black Americans specifically into concentrated neighborhoods, right? Because they were only allowed to live in certain places. So we ended up with neighborhoods that were largely Black. And then uh, we cited toxic industrial facilities, highways, other kind of undesirable polluting facilities um, in or near those neighborhoods. And obviously those uh, laws and rules don't exist anymore, but it's a lingering effect of those practices mm -hmm. that um, those neighborhoods where people of color live, even if they're now affluent, even if they're in rural areas and regardless of which state they are, they still mm -hmm. tend to have higher levels of harmful air pollution. And um, there's another example of uh, cosmetics and beauty products. So um, mm -hmm. products that are marketed to black women and women of color, um, in particular, hair straighteners and relaxers tend that to be so much upsetting. more toxic, right? Yeah. Much more toxic, have more cancer causing chemicals, um, chemicals that raise our cancer risk than um, similar products marketed to white women. And historically, um, Again, this is a kind of like lingering effect of something that happened a very long time ago. Historically, um, enslavers and colonizers used perceived racial differences, uh, things like skin color and also hair texture mm -hmm. as justification for treating black women as less than human. And so it became a survival adaptation to um, make textured black hair look more like white women's hair, straight, right? <laughs> and uh, so the, the popularity of those products and the marketing of those products to black women is a kind of lingering um, effect of that survival adaptation. And, and actually still now, um, there have been attempts to make this illegal at the federal level that have not succeeded. So it's still legal in a number of states for workplaces to ban traditional hairstyles for black women. It and still at, in 2023, in 2023, that is still legal. So there you was can't a, have like uh, an, an, like a natural, like a large, you know, Afro or something. 
It could be banned in your workplace if you live in a state that has not prohibited that kind of workplace discrimination. So many states have, um, but there was um, federal legislation called the Crown Act that was up for consideration last year. It did not pass. So there are still a handful of states where this is allowed. And then even in states that have banned, um, you know, explicit discrimination about hairstyles in the workplace. Um, it's often still considered like more professional for black women to have straight hair. So there's all this kind of social pressure to use these products. These products are, you know, kind of aggressively marketed to black women. They tend to be more wow. readily available in the stores um, in black communities. And they're, they're generally much more toxic. So, yeah. um, you know, I spoke with one researcher for the book whose work is really focused on um, racial disparities in uh, harmful exposures through cosmetics. And she said, we have to be able to acknowledge systemic racism and its lingering effects and try to address those if we want to advocate for environmental health. It's not possible to kind of do this kind of research in a vacuum where you're not willing to consider, um, you know, the the social and cultural forces that are creating these problems. Yeah, it's amazing how that has fed into every area of society, how racism, you know, the systemic racism just continues to show up in yet another and another and another uh, area of life. Um, Speaking of which, maybe that that's a good uh, segue into intersectionality, um, because everything's connected. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? You know, your your point about that a little bit. Yeah. So I think, you know, it it can be. <laughs> I think at first glance, maybe it's not obvious to people that um, our health and the environment and. Mm -hmm. uh, racism are all interconnected, right. but they very much are, right? We can't, um, we can't really address our, the problems we have in our environment without uh, addressing systemic racism. And if we address systemic racism, we'll have a pretty good shot of also addressing these problems yeah. that are impacting our environment. Yeah. And I think also, um, you know, it's easy I think about like what I was taught about the environment when I was um, like in elementary school and, and talking about recycling. And I think often it's been framed as this thing that's like out there, right? The earth is like this separate yeah. other place. The environment is this thing mm -hmm. that like we're, we should separate take care from. of it to like do mm -hmm. a nice thing, but it's, it's separate from us. And actually yeah. our health is totally dependent on the health of our environment, right? Yeah. We're learning that more and more as we see the effects of, climate change and wildfires and the plastic pollution crisis, um, it's becoming impossible to ignore um, the ways in which like our, our health as human beings is completely dependent on the health of the planet. So mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, it's really important to think about these issues collectively and in a, a big picture way. And then, um, you know, uh, certainly taking like small local steps are important too, um, but it's important to be able to frame this and talk about it in a way that considers that bigger picture and the ways these issues are all connected. You know, um, I appreciate that, that explanation. And it, it reminds me of how much uh, we can learn and need to learn from indigenous peoples who, who, who really take that a step further and always have as an this is ancient wisdom that, you know, I am the soil, I am the water, I am the air. It's not us here and them that there, you know, like you said, people look at it as separate. And I think that's sometimes a hard concept for people who have not grown up with that philosophy to think that, well, yes, you say we are the soil, we are the earth, you know, but, but mm -hmm. to actually grok it, to actually internalize that and, and, and understand it, it can really inform our um, decision making so much more, and I think we it would be helpful for people to just study any kind of indigenous wisdom that speaks to that, because you do start to see like how where does this air start stop and I begin, or where does that mm -hmm. water we're drinking stop? Yes, of course we're it. So um, another topic, but important I think in this conversation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 
So um, I, I see. Do we, if we still have time, I want to talk just for a moment about because I want to make sure we promise people that we would we would at least end with um, a few, you know, maybe five or so um, suggestions on how we can each take take action in our own lives to protect ourselves and to protect each other and our children. Um, but but the last point I guess I'd like to have you address is a, something that I think is really not known, which is the connection between air pollution and mental illness. How can that be? Can you explain that? I was, yeah, I've done some reporting on this and it was really surprising for me to learn that I think it might be obvious that if we're worried about air pollution, right, if there's air pollution in our region or yeah. we're reading in the news about wildfires and we're worried about it, that that could impact our our mental health by making us feel anxious or oh, depressed or yeah. worried, right? right? But I was really surprised to learn that research also shows that being exposed to air pollution can actually alter our brains in ways that can um, cause mental health problems, that can cause yeah, anxiety and cause depression um, or exacerbate um, things like schizophrenia or other um, neurological or mental health problems. Mm. And it's, you know, the research on that is just kind of beginning, but it's part of this bigger body of research indicating mm. that um, air pollution is harmful to just about every part of our bodies. So when scientists first started studying air pollution, they were really focused on the lungs, obviously, mm -hmm. right? That makes sense. Sure. They were focused on the lungs and the airways. Sure. And then eventually they started figuring out, oh, wait, we're seeing that this causes heart problems too. Mm -hmm. And maybe we're noticing um, kidney problems. And now we're noticing like chronic pain and full body inflammation when people are exposed to high levels of air pollution. And so, um, you know, it's becoming clearer and clearer that even at levels that meet our current um, laws and, mm -hmm. and health guidelines for exposure to air pollution, we're still seeing negative health effects, including mm -hmm. um, increased risk for mental illness. So I think it all just kind of points to the need for um, regulators to be looking at the most current science um, and and yeah. focusing on, you know, right now our laws are kind of based on like what was achievable 20 years ago with the pollution controls we had available. Right. Right. And so it's definitely time to revisit those regulations, look at the health data and make laws that are, um, the, it, the, our technology to reduce pollution has improved a lot and we just need to require industrial mm -hmm. polluters to implement them in a lot of cases. You know, you do mention also about uh, just water. I think it was the water standards are 20 to 40 years behind the science, behind today's science. How can we change that? I mean, obviously the problems that have come up in the last 40 years are the problem. So to ignore something like 40, 20, even 20, even 10 years of, uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's this always come down to money. We don't have enough time, energy, science to affect laws because it seems like, you know, that should be goal number one. Right. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, one of the the biggest challenges with our drinking water regulations not being up to date is that mm -hmm. um, the EPA, the U.S. Environmental Protection mm -hmm. Agency, has been uh, understaffed and underfunded for decades under mm -hmm. numerous presidential administrations. And so we really need... Um, that agency has to be funded and staffed to be able to do its job. There are regulations that that agency is required by law to revisit and update that they are decades behind on. And in yeah. some cases, they've been sued repeatedly by citizens group and environmental health uh, advocacy groups. And, you know, courts have found, yes, you do actually have to revisit these regulations and pass new ones. And then it still just doesn't get done because they, mm -hmm. the agency does not have the resources. So um, we really need to make clear that, uh, you know, we as regular people uh, have the political will that we want to see this done, that it's a priority. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of a, 
it's a big it's a big challenge. Another problem is um, that I think is unique to the United States to some extent is we have mm-hmm. this kind of anti regulation sentiment. You mentioned yeah. people saying like, "Oh, California is such a pain," and they have all these it regulations. Political. And, mm-hmm. Right, and um, that has been really driven by the Republican Party in the United States um, in the last decade or two. Um, you may remember that when Donald Trump first took office, one of his first executive actions said that um, any agency proposing a new regulation had to offer up two to be repealed in exchange for that one mm-hmm. new regulation. And that was with no consideration for what those regulations what were, or what they protected yeah. us from, a, right? A just kind of a blanket, statement. a blanket yeah. policy against yeah. regulation. And so we also need, in addition to kind of funding and staffing and prioritizing our regulatory agencies, um, we also need to do some work to kind of change the way Americans think about regulations and help people recognize that, um, you know, they're they're really important and they protect us from things like carcinogens in our drinking water. Yeah, uh, the fact that it's become political is so sad, whether we're talking about the environment, whether we're talking about, you know, the subject of today of just, you know, keeping horrible things out of our food, water, air. Uh, That should not be a political conversation. Uh, I know it's often as um, it's often presented as well, they're they're anti business because they're putting people are wanting to put restrictions on business. They want to kill business. And it's like, no, that's not true. We just want to have a healthy, healthy world. And that should not fall on party lines. Everybody wants healthy Mm -hmm. children. And a lot of it is just not believed. Same thing happened with climate change. People don't believe it because they're not given the full information to consider. And it's presented as a political binary choice, not, not where that belongs. And that's, I mean, it, it's one of the places where I think podcasts can come come into play as a you know hearing more of the voice of people that's not. This isn't about a left or right issue. This isn't about right. politics at all. This is about health, human health, animal health, planetary health, which we all, every single person in the world has has a right to and need, and and has the need to fight for. So. Um, yeah, and I just I just want to reiterate too that um, many other parts of the world do a much better job than we do in the United States of regulating these chemicals, including um, the European Union, uh, and the countries in the European Union still have thriving economies and successful right. businesses, and mm-hmm. industries are able to yeah. operate and make profits. So it's absolutely possible to do. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel here, right? There are lots of templates of other places that are already doing a good job of this mm. that we could follow here in the United States. Yeah. Well, Christina, let's, uh, let's switch to some positive news. I think sometimes, you know, this happened to me a little bit. I, I mentioned at the beginning is I just start looking around and what's on the carpet, what's in everything I touch, and you don't want to get paralysis. You don't want analysis paralysis. You want to just keep living life, but also be aware. So what are, what are some of the ways that uh, you would, you would ask or suggest to people that they can be responsible citizens, take action to, to create healthier environments for themselves and their family and their community. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. So um, there are a lot of different roles that people with different strengths can play to help uh, push this movement forward. Mm -hmm. And I think, sort of three broad categories to think about are um, supporting existing cancer prevention efforts that are focused on preventing our exposure to harmful chemicals, uh, pushing for better chemical regulations, and applying market pressure. And um, I think it's I think it's also important to know that no one has to start from scratch here, right? There mm-hmm. are brilliant people and organizations that are doing this work every day. So we can just jump in and support their work and learn what they're doing right. and find out what they need. We don't have to uh, sit down and and to overthink how to right how to address <laughs> yeah. this problem from scratch. So. Um, When it comes to supporting cancer prevention initiatives that are aimed at reducing 
exposure to harmful chemicals. One really easy way to do this is donating time or money to organizations that are leading this work to help power up those efforts. Um, another way is to sign up for these groups' newsletters or follow them on social media so it's easy to quickly respond to their calls to action if there's mm -hmm. a piece of legislation up for consideration and it's time to call the lawmakers who are voting on it, um, if there's something on the ballot related to chemical reg regulations that we need to go vote for, um, if it's if they need people to sign a petition about uh, banning a harmful pesticide. Okay. So um, I list, I have a long list of those organizations in the appendix mm -hmm. of my book to you make do. it easy yeah. to kind of quickly follow them. Um, and again, I think I said this, but um, the easiest, easiest thing, if all of that feels time consuming is donate some money, donate some money to the organizations that are already doing this work, um, either at the state or local or national level. Um, we can also uh, push our lawmakers to focus on better chemical regulations mm -hmm. by contacting our local and state and federal lawmakers, um, even just to let them know that this issue is important to you, that this issue is a priority for their constituents. Even if it's not about a particular issue, um, you'd be shocked actually how little lawmakers hear from their constituents. Right. And Very so, little. and how they seriously kind of, they do take it. You know? Right. So they, they really take note. Um, they if do. someone spends the time to reach out and say, Hey, I'm really concerned about the way that exposure to harmful chemicals is raising my kid's cancer risk. Um, what are you doing to address mm -hmm. this issue? Um, urging them to support better chemical regulations, um, signing petitions. There are a couple of websites where you can sign up for notifications about proposed federal and state regulations by topic. Um, so, you know, you could put in chemical regulations or um, carcinogens in the environment. And then if a bill is up for consideration, you can contact your lawmakers when it's timely. Um, those websites include govtrack.us, congress.gov and openstates.org. Um, and then and again, I'll, I'll put those mm -hmm. onto the website, uh, onto the show notes too, so people can quickly Great. go just browse through them. Yeah. Great. And then um, again, donating time or money to organizations that are lobbying for better, better chemical regulations is another big way to help. And I listed a bunch of those in the appendix. Yeah. Of my can, I, can I interject something real quick, too, about what, a point you just made about contacting your local representatives? Because my daughter has worked at the state of Colorado um, for, for a state rep. Um, hardly anyone calls. Hardly anyone writes. Yeah. And when, when two or three people, I've heard the conversations when, oh, we got three calls about this topic in a week. In a week or even, I mean, that just that little actually gets their attention and that matters, right? right? And then you can imagine if you had a concern and you you were able to get five people or 10 people or, or a group of a hundred people just to call, it has an impact. They are there to represent you. So that local government really keeps coming back into play on these things. I just wanted to say that I, I have just seen many times, it's very, very powerful to do just a quick, one quick call or letter. Yeah. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. Um, and the, the third kind of big thing we can do is apply market pressure. So Huge. if you find out that, um, and that, that takes a little more than just voting with our wallets, right? So if you find out that the hand cream you've been using your whole life that you love, that's your favorite hand cream includes chemicals that are raising your cancer risk and you decide to make a switch, if mm -hmm. you can take 10 extra minutes to make a phone call or write an email or even send a tweet to let the company you're switching from know, hey, I love this product. I'm not going to buy it anymore because it contains these chemicals that are raising my cancer risk and let company B know, hey, I switched to your product because it's free of these chemicals. Thank you so hmm. much for doing that. Um, you can really amplify the impact of that choice. That's another thing where companies just don't hear from consumers that often. And um, especially if it's something public saying, you know, this product contains harmful ingredients that helps hmm. really apply pressure for them to switch to a, a cleaner formula, a cleaner option. So again, um, you know, we can't 
do it all through just the marketplace. We really need regulations to um, require companies to do better. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for those, if we're making these kind of personal switches in our own lives, we can amplify yeah. the impact by um, taking an, some extra time to let those companies know about that choice. That's brilliant. I had literally never once thought of that. So I appreciated <laughs> that tip a lot. Uh, Christina, thank you. I'm just going to, I'm going to hold this up one more time. A new war on cancer. Um, and uh, we didn't really talk about the people that are in the book, which is such, you know, there's only so much you can do in an hour, but I really encourage people to read it because it just gives you a, a very personal way to see how, how people do are making change. And it's inspiring to read stories of other people that are, you know, that have made these uh, become aware and read it and put it yeah. I mean, they've become aware of a problem and they have gone into action. And now you can read about what they've done. And it just makes it much more approachable, not scary to go talk to a company or or anyone. Or, or There's a number of different ways that they work on it. So um, I encourage and hopefully people to inspiring i think i think this problem can feel or this issue when you start learning about it, it can feel really scary and overwhelming right. and mm -hmm. um but the book is really centered Hopeful. around profiles of people who are devoting their lives to creating change mm -hmm. and i think it is hopeful yeah thank you for saying that i found yeah. that when i learned their stories not just about their work but what drives them to do the work right. um it really made me feel hopeful and inspired mm -hmm. and like i could do things to drive positive change. And so right. I hope that reading the book yeah. um, makes other people feel that too. Yeah, I, I think it will. Absolutely. It, it does give you hope and makes you want to keep trying and, and not feel like this is bigger than us because it's not. It is us. So Christina, thank you. This was so fascinating. I could actually talk to you for another hour, but you know, I think we're out of time. Um, I hope the book does really well. I hope mostly for you, but also for, for, for our survival, for our health, that, that people read it and pass it on and share it with book clubs and, you know, any way that they can just to raise awareness. This is the most critical piece of raising awareness and you've done a really great job doing that. So thank you so much. And, you know, maybe we'll follow up in a year or so and see how things, you know, what's, what's happening, what changes have been made might be, might be fun to do. So thanks. Yeah, sure. I'd love to come back. Thank you so much, Deborah. All right.